you've had the benefit of admiring that beautiful photo in the background for a while now. And uh, I hope, hopefully you've, you've looked at it deeply because to many it's just an outback country road. Um, to me it's what we do. Ultimately it's an enabler for our communities. That's, that's a road out in the Kununurra. It has verges, it has lines, it had signs, it's got guideposts, it's got drainage. Um, that's what we do. We maintain these assets, um, almost utilities for the communities that we're part of across Australia. If you look deeply enough, it's also a quarry. And uh, it's not a quarry as you traditionally know it, but it's the home of many of the quarrying materials that we've generated over the years and put them down in something that's perpetually recyclable. And uh, a lot of the asset managers and a lot of the people in our line of business are now recognising the value in those assets for the future community, for the future generations, but also to ensure that we extend the life of the quarries that we go and traditionally dig out of as we go forward. So my name's Dante Cromasco. Um, I'm a civil engineer, started at University of New South Wales. I'm from country New South Wales. I've been in this business for 22 years. I've been leading the business from a national perspective for the last six years. And I, ha I guess I have a passion about building teams. And you'll hear a little bit more about why we think we've been successful because of what our competitors in this space are now doing. It's always my challenge to think different with every tender to put in an alternative. And I guess we see that in the success of the business today. We're big, how big? Uh, 36,000 kilometres across Australia, 25 in New Zealand. Pop quiz, circumference of the world, 40,000 k's. So we can, we can do a lap and a bit. And uh, it's a lap and a bit of maintaining those networks that we saw before. We're, we represent in Australia about 70% of the total down a business in what I lead. And uh, we're also number one or working towards being number one in a lot of the markets that we operate in. We're big in the manufacture of asphalt. And again, from a pop quiz perspective, if I just take Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and I jump in my car and I decide to drive it, we manufacture enough asphalt to lay a two-lane road between those capital cities from start to finish. 5,200 kilometres, 3 million tonnes at 40 mil thick. So we're out there having a crack every day and we're doing it every year. When we're doing that, we've also got an eye on savings and what we're doing from a repurposing perspective. This year we've saved 23,000 tonnes of binder. This is petrochemical that goes into those roads because we're using them as long, thin, black quarries. We don't own the quarries and that's why our contracting's probably a little bit sharper than our competitors. We also have a large logistical capability through our ability to move the binder itself. So we do 14,000 truck journeys counting about 20,000 litres of bitumen every single year. That's 300 million litres of bitumen that we cart from a logistics perspective around Australia. And we do that very, very well with our own fleet of tankers. We're strong in government, across all government agencies. And we're also big enough to drive change from a worldwide perspective. When we talk to our manufacturers of the plant and equipment that we use, we force change from a safety perspective from a sustainability perspective. We've seen manufacturers as big as Caterpillar introduce reversing technology that reduces the speed at which some of our equipment will go backwards because of our passion to ensure that our people don't become victims of plant pedestrian interface issues at our work sites. We drive our manufacturing partners in the manufacture of asphalt that the worldwide competitors to change the way they look at it to ensure that sustainability is at the forefront. And since 2012, we've seen the technology that we've developed right here in Australia be adopted as the world leading technology and we've continued to evolve that and you'll see a little bit of that uh, in something we've prepared a little bit later during my presentation. So despite the low population growth, uh, we do have a big backlog of maintenance to attend to. 
Our market's about $8 billion a year. We're sitting at about $1.8 billion of turnover in the roads business in Australia. Key customers in state and local governments. Uh, we're also picking up work in the uh, private private road network and toll operators as well at the moment. Um, there is a huge backlog of work and that's why we're seeing right now through the stimulus funding um, lots and lots of work that uh, our people are out there having a go at every day, influencing the client from a delivery perspective, ensuring that we get beyond has to be spent by 30th of June. This is our ability to influence those government customers about how to stretch that value because right now all of industry is pretty stretched. Um, we've been very, very busy. In fact, since March last year when COVID really took hold, I guess our biggest impact is trying to work out how we're going to get our people to take leave. And that's, uh, that's a big thing. For those that have got thousands of employees, you can't, you can't go letting them get too much leave. So we've, we've asked them to take leave during the quieter periods. Um, people value their jobs. They want to ensure that they have got something to come to and, and I guess as a result we've seen uh, better uptake in, in how we use our sick leave and those sorts of things because they value their place of employment. Uh, we're seeing a lot of support in recycling. It's a bipartisan support across all levels of government from waste strategies, uh, how we recycle and some of our, our journey in that is uh, our product in the, in the recycled asphalt space, Reconifalt which has a, a myriad of uh, repurposed products from first use um, materials. We've, we've manufactured over 200,000 tonnes of our, of our Reconifalt since we've started marketing that brand. Uh, that's about 50 million glass bottle equivalents, 180 million plastic bag equivalents. They're the plastic bags, that, anything that, that scrunches, whether it's your bread wrapper, whether it's the one that you pay 10 cents for at the at Woolies or the one that wraps around your, your cruskets that you buy at the supermarket. All of that goes back to the supermarkets if you can and uh, we take it from there and repurpose it into high value uh, products to go back into the network. You can see in the slide at the bottom that over time, it's a, it's a very small growth but uh, we're red, we're, we're not the in-house in this case, the in-house is, is the blue from a government perspective. Uh, we're the red guys and uh, we're seeing our our growth of the market grow over time as, um, as, as governments rely more and more on people and businesses that uh, exist around Australia to, to give them better outcomes than what they're currently doing. I guess the journey uh, for me in this role started in earnest in 2006 and uh, whilst I don't expect you to truly understand, and let's just concentrate on Australia, what all those dots and, and uh, triangles and funny shapes mean. I guess ultimately, to, to steal a real estate term, it's about position. We're close to beaches, we've got views, we're close to public transport. We were a renovator's delight and uh, we sought to take the positions across various multiple business in every state and territory in major metro areas in regional locations and take those positions and generate a strong business with a national flavour, a truly national flavour. There are lots of small players everywhere we go, but they don't have the secret recipes. They don't have the franchising ability that we can from a national perspective. And we're seeing our national competitors that traditionally operate from a state-based jurisdictional perspective now move to what we've been building for the last 15 years. It's going to be hard to replicate because you need people to go on that journey, you need strong leadership and you need people to believe that that's the best way for it to happen. It also means that we can move people without fear or favour independently across states and borders. So we can be more efficient where it's really busy because they're not relying on local contractors but rather taking some of our internal people from say a quieter area in northern Queensland where it might be the wet season and we can move those resources down into the, the busier areas. 70% of our revenue comes from the state, state capitals and 30% from a regional basis. So you can still see even at 30% it's a, a fair amount of uh, investment in those regional communities. So how do we do it? 
I guess we, we're, cr we're creating an attractive and inclusive, safe workplace. We have integrated services with a national footprint. We're working all the time to decommoditise what we do, and that's through technology, that's through innovation, that's through recycling. And basically, by being at the top end as a road network manager through our DM Roads branding, uh, we are acting like a quasi-government, a steward of the networks, whereby we decide how to maintain, how to upgrade, how to periodically improve the networks that we have been tasked with, and then go out into the marketplace and find the best provider. Now, sometimes we're forced to go to a competitor, but that's okay. We learn, we improve, we get better. And I guess our customers also believe that you can't truly be a steward of the network if you're always giving yourself the work. Um, so yeah, it's our ability from an internal perspective to, to stay sharp at every opportunity. Our recycling, our repurposing also ensures that we are diverting some of the key materials that have been generated once, that are too good to waste, that will go back into our networks as we move forward. You'll see a continuing shift, I guess, to more stimulus funding over the, over the foreseeable future, but importantly, for the roads business right now, we know that the stimulus funding will get turned off. It's inevitable. At some point in the near future, it might be two, might be five years, this will get turned off. And then the market that has been built through the capacity that has been generated will ensure that there's lots of competition, lots more competition, because there's not as much work. And people, businesses will start doing funny things to maintain market share. Importantly, we're investing today and we've been investing for the last 10 or 15 years to ensure that when that time comes, we are the lowest cost producer. We have the right technology, we are diverting materials that would otherwise go to landfill, repurposing, re-engineering, using our connections with industry and what we've invested in to get better outcomes at a lower cost point than our competitors and thereby ensure the ongoing sustainability of what we do. So that's a little bit about roads. Now, as always, we have a plan A. So trust me, the only person feeling uncomfortable right now is me watching this video. But uh, a few weeks ago, we weren't really sure how this was all going to run down. So we, we took the opportunity to, to uh, give you a snapshot of, of uh, some of the things that we do with a, a little bit more colour, a little bit more depth, a little bit of noise. I guess we're COVID ready. And uh, so I'll leave you with our plan A. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm here in Epping at our joint venture repurposed site. It's a very busy site and I'm going to try and attempt to tell you what we're doing here and importantly how that all fits in with the rest of what we're doing across not only the eastern seaboard but the rest of Australia within road services. You'll hear some background noise, you'll see some construction activity. We're upgrading this plant far quicker than we could have ever have hoped because of the sheer volume of material that we're seeing coming in, being repurposed and sent back out to market. Please bear with me. If you can't quite hear me, then just lean in a little bit closer. We're having great fun here. Hopefully you will too. The types of products that we specialise here in uh, Category C waste, where our technology enables us to wash that waste, uh, achieve certification to enable it to go back out into the construction arena. We also take general construction waste from major civil rehab uh, projects, for example, in the rail space or in the, in the highway reconstruction space. We also take things like recycled asphalt, uh, street sweepings, and this particular facility is also capable of washing domestic products like glass that would otherwise go to landfill. So the machine behind us is able to wash that glass, resize it, and then turn it into effectively a, a sand replacement. Uh, sand is a very important product in a lot of the road making materials that we focus on within the roads division and as a result we are, we are solving a problem from our general population by substituting virgin materials in some of our road making materials that we're putting out there. We were able to take those products and repurpose them and pull those products away from being turned into waste. We coined the phrase pulling products not pushing waste. Just down the road from here about five kilometres we have one of our larger asphalt plants at Summerton. 
It's capable of producing asphalt at a rate of 300 tonne an hour, but more importantly, we're also able to recycle at a percentage point of around 50%. It's facilities like these that work hand in glove with a facility like Summerton to enable us to ensure that the sustainability of our products and the high recycle content to ensure that quality is still maintained, yet at the same time ensuring that uh, our cost base is kept very, very low. In other areas, for example, in the north of Brisbane at Brendale, we are soon to commission a brand new facility, not dissimilar to what we've got here, with an asphalt plant on that side as well. The asphalt plant is well into construction. We're, we're going to be seeing the commissioning of that plant into uh, early July. It's capable of recycling up to 100%, so it's taken that next quantum leap in technology that's been made available over the last few years, and we've jumped straight onto that. But more importantly, it will also have a facility like this adjacent to it. Not only are we doing that in Brendale, we're also recreating this in Sydney as well. Our new facility in Devon Street, in Rose Hill, will also be featuring the same technology. We're looking forward to these facilities being opened in the very near future. It just underlines again our push for sustainability and remaining market leaders in this space. Importantly, whilst the industry is seeing large levels of stimulus funding come through the government channels. We believe there will be a time in the future whereby this stimulus will be starting to be turned off and it will be coming down to who has the right technology to produce at the lowest cost for longer. Our ability to recycle and using leading edge technology, we believe will put us on a firm footing to ensure that we're at the front mark and maintain our volumes in a tightening market some years in the future. My name is Kamal Habibullah. I'm the project delivery head for the rail and transit systems business. So just a bit about my background. Um, I've been with Downer for almost 12 years. So I joined in 2008 with the original rail business. So I've got a long history in uh, rail delivery. Um, what I want to do before we go into our business in general and the status of our uh, projects and regions, I just want to give you a snapshot of the market. So over the next five years, there's going to be significant investment in the rail sector. So this is governments, federal, state, and even New Zealand are planning to invest. I won't ask you to get your calculators out. It's $77 billion over the next five years across the region. So these are complex rail projects. So requiring a sophisticated uh, rail integration experience and capability, capability and experience Downer has. Examples of these projects, the Sydney Metro, we all know the Northwest Rail Link that opened up and connected into Chatswood. That's extending out to Bankstown. There's a new line going out to Parramatta, which is a Sydney Metro West. There's a new line going to the new airport, which is a greater uh, Metro, uh, Sydney Metro um, line out there. There's a suburban rail loop in Melbourne, which is a circle line um, on the outer of Melbourne connecting into the existing network to unlock some of the congestion issues they have there. In New Zealand is the Auckland Light Rail and in Queensland there's new trains uh, for the Cross River Rail. So I'll touch on some of those shortly. So how is Downer positioned to capitalise on some of those opportunities? So we have unique capabilities. Our competitors some do rail systems, rolling stock, signalling, wayside. Some do civil. We do it all. We have it all under our roof. And I'll showcase some examples of that shortly. We're strategically located throughout Australia. We have hubs in New South Wales, Victoria, uh, Queensland, recently Adelaide, and our joint venture in uh, WA. So we're strategically located to capitalise on these opportunities, particularly, as Grant said, when governments look to minimise their sovereign risk and bring activities back on shore. Innovation, that is core to the rail systems business. There was a question previously, uh, an example as to how we are, uh, I suppose, an example of decarbonisation. The second point there in the third silo we're actively working with one of our customers in Sydney to actually reduce their carbon footprint. The outcome, obviously, 
we're working through that process, but the outcome is removing 7,000 uh, cars off the road. So therefore, we are a leader in this market. We're the biggest provider of rolling stock. We've, we operate 70% of Sydney, um, Sydney's network at the moment. We are the largest maintainer of rolling stock in Australia. And through the Keolis Downer joint venture, we're the largest operator of intermodal transport through our bus systems as well. We are looking at expansion internationally into other segments, electric buses, is a natural fit to our core competence. It's a systems inter engineering, system, systems integration um, sector, so that's something that we may look at. And we're looking at new partners as well. So uh, I've already touched on our geographic footprint, as Dante said, a lot of colors and dots there. I won't go through each, each one of them. But probably of most interest is the top one, Maribara. So I, I, I mentioned the opportunity in Queensland new trains to support the Cross River Rail project. The Queensland Government has stated publicly those trains will be built in Maribara region. We're the only player in the market that has a facility in that region. So this is probably the most important slide of the presentation and I think it's been presented in a few forums, but this is our strategic intent pursuing opportunities with long-term revenue outcomes. Examples are the Sydney Growth Trains project that we currently have in Sydney. It's a short-term EPC delivery phase. Uh, in the SGT contract, we have 41 trains delivered over a two to three year cycle. They'll be completed in June this year, but it has a 25 year O&M period. Not only that, we're also working with the customer because we build intimacy and we're looking at enhancement opportunities through that relationship as well. Another example is HCMT, where we're delivering 65 seven-car trains and we have a maintenance contract that runs through to 2053. The Queensland opportunity will be a replica or should be a replica of those examples I've just presented. So just running through the regions, just to update on the business. So we have 78 uh, Waratah trains that are in service. They were delivered some time ago. Exceptional reliability, the backbone of the Sydney network. We have the Sydney Growth, Growth Trains project, which is uh, what you would call the evolution of the base platform. 41 trains, 36 are in service. The remaining five will be delivered over the next three, three months. But most proudly, it is the fastest delivery of any rolling stock in this country, un unmatched by any of our competitors. So in total, we have 119 Waratah trains that are operating on the Sydney uh, network. And we have an option with the government that's contracted for a further 60 eight-car trains if they sh uh, so choose to exercise. We also have the Millennium trains you can say these are the, these are the aged workers of the fleet, uh, of the network. We continue to maintain them. They're housed at the Auburn Maintenance Centre as well. So, so when you actually look at our presence in um, New South Wales, and particularly Sydney, we're our foundational partner with the, with the uh, Sydney trains operator. Victoria, and this is showcases an example of the one roof uh, uh, I suppose one roof that our capabilities we have in-house. Uh, 65 seven-car trains. We have the largest maintenance facility that we built in-house. We started on a light service facility. We have a maintenance contract that runs out to 2053. We have interfaces with the high-capacity signalling that's being implemented by another alliance that runs through the Metro Tunnel and we have an option for a further 60 trains. So in terms of where we are with that project, five of the 65 trains are currently in service. There's 200 cars that have been built and a further 27 trains in various phases of testing, commissioning, or end acceptance. On top of that, we're working with Yarra Trams to overhaul 400 of their trams through an East Preston facility. 
in Queensland. We're in a unique situation where we've been asked by the government there to modify um, some new trains that were put into service by one of our competitors. Those trains require modification to bring them up to DSAT compliance or disability compliance. So the government has trusted us to undertake that modification. We recently signed a alliance with Queensland Rail. So this is a collaborative agreement with Queensland Rail to overhaul their existing fleet. So that's just been, uh, that's about to commence with 200 cars there. And coming back to innovation and decarbonisation or in other forums, carbon neutrality, we're looking at a hydrogen platform with our customer in Queensland as well. In Western Australia, we have the JV. And last but not least, we have the Keolis Down Joint Venture, the largest tram network in Melbourne. We have a light rail facility, a light rail network in, in Newcastle that we're operating and the Gold Coast light rail as well. And on top of that, the largest operator of buses in Australia. So that's a summary of the rail and transit systems business. But what I've hopefully highlighted today is we're, we're the largest rail provider in Australia, whether it be rolling stock, whether it be maintenance. Um, we're very selective in the way we um, choose what we're pursuing. We're looking at short-term, low-risk opportunities with long-term revenue streams. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Mark McKay, as it says up on the slide. Uh, I look after the infrastructure projects business uh, within uh, Downer's Australian portfolio. Um, this slide, uh, you would have all seen various cuts of. In fact, Grant put an earlier slide up that demonstrates um, where our, our core markets are going in road, rail and power. And, you know, we can talk about the absoluteness of the numbers on the board, but we can clearly see a trend uh, which, is, which is heading up, and it's, it really is unparalleled spending in this, in this space. Um, it, it's interesting, though, because the, the, the markets are a little bit different, and our previous participation is different, and I'll talk to that. So the transport business um, that, that we're currently in now has had, you know, for Downer, um, pretty tremendous growth since about 2014, and that was sort of on the, at the end of that peak that you see there at the top in the dark and light blue was about the time that we started to form the business. Um, at that time, and people talk about the profitless boom that happened prior, there was a lot of market consolidation and a, and a lot of things changed actually in terms of the risk profile in this particular market. You know, at that point in time, um, there was a lot of pushback on, uh, on the risk allocation models that were coming out of clients, you know, unfair risk allocation models about taking on ground conditions and utilities work that was just really unquantifiable at that point in time. So we really noticed the change in the fact that there needed to be a lot of uh, infrastructure built in that area, and we formed this, this transport business. Now, it started fairly small beginnings. We had a few you know, existing pockets of capability in Downer, and we've grown that business from some $80 million in revenue to about $700 million over that time. Um, the business has been profitable every year, and we've been able to reinvest in systems, and I'll talk to that shortly. Um, what, what we see there, and, and, and correct me, I got that wrong before, the, um, the, 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 the business I was speaking to was actually the, uh, the, the, the two bottom sections, which are the, uh, the, the roads and the, and the rail section. The dark blue at the top is actually power, so I'll come back to that. Power has been a business that Down has been in for, for quite some time. I mean, the, the roots of our power transmission business in substations and HV actually go back to Italy in the 1930s with SAE. And we've been in this game for a very long time and we've continued to deliver good work in, in you know, let's say um, yearly renewals of existing infrastructure. Um, there's certainly some uptick there as renewables came online. But importantly for us, it isn't a new business like transport, it's an old business with very deep capability. And in fact, when, when this business came into my portfolio, the guys had told me that we have an archive base of, uh, of, of drawings of existing power networks, particularly for New South Wales, that even the government didn't have at the time, and often now, um, the, the, the TNSPs come to us and ask for access to our records so they can see what was built. So it's, it just speaks to the fact that we've got deep capability in that space. 
And that power portfolio has come into my business quite recently, and the idea there being that we've consolidated the project work into one location, so we get you know, consistent outcomes and we can apply a consistent set of systems to the way that we undertake that work. Now importantly, th this is a very important slide um, for me to talk to you and for you to recognise. Um, because we're in these boom areas, there is a lot of work coming down the pipeline. Too much work for us and probably too much work for you know, the entire delivery capability in Australia right now. So we need to be very selective about the type of work that we take on. And we've created a, a process within the business, um, we call it our swim lanes. And this gives us very, very strong guidance about the types of contracts and customers that we want to work for. So the top part of the, uh, of the model speaks to the commercial model. And, and as I said before, there's been evolution of these models coming out of government. Yeah, it used to be hard, hard dollar contracting, contractor takes all risk. Now we're seeing a lot more risk sharing. We're seeing alliances, we're seeing managing contractor type arrangements, and sort of various splits of those that apportion risk in the right buckets. So we're, we're very definitive about that, and you know, opportunities that come in don't pass the first gate unless they get through that particular um, selection process. Um, the other key consideration is the customer. Um, we, you know, we work for a range of customers over the years. Uh, we know the ones that we want to work for, where we've had good track record and, uh, yeah, and, and really fair approaches to the way that they you know, treat us when we work for them. And the, the final part is the capability. You know, we're in transport, it has been a journey over five or six years and you know, you've got to try things to see where you're successful and where you're not and through that, you know, we've got a really strong lessons learnt process and we've really got a core set of capabilities that we can rely on. So we look at these opportunities through those lenses to pick the right things for us to go forward with. So we certainly are prepared to say no and more risk sharing, you know, opportunities mean more opportunities for Downer. So a very important gateway for us. Second part of it though is, you know, you've landed the opportunity and, and this is complex infrastructure. You've got to deliver for success. And as I mentioned before, you know, on our journey, we've been reinvesting in systems and process and governance to ensure that we are getting the outcomes that we need. Um, on the bottom right of the slide, we've got our commercial operating model and we've got our, our eight key pillars in there. And they, you can see them up there, but they, they typically cover the process and governance we have in there, understanding estimation, uh, value engineering, how to deal with vendors in the market. You know, we do use a large supply chain. And importantly, a lot of that supply chain is internal. You know, often when we come to these opportunities, we're bringing in a range of downer capabilities. Certainly uh, Dante's business, uh, Stephen Kakabas' business, as uh, Kamal explained, um, they, they all come into our business as well as external supply chain. Our contract management, cost management, um, very, very important to know your numbers all the time and we pride ourselves in our ability to understand our positions. Uh, cash management and commercial reporting. So those eight pillars are the foundations for how we train people in our business. Existing people and new people coming in. You know, we don't presume people come into our business with a, a knowledge of how to do this kind of work. We reset the bar and we put time into it and that's been a big investment for the business. Um, the slides at the, well, the pictures at the top of the slide, uh, we have a system called DBOT, and it's our you know, internal uh, system that we've developed um, to manage the digital world out in, out in, out in project land. Um, basically, it starts with a very user-friendly digital site diary. So we encourage our guys out there to always take very comprehensive records of what's happening on site all the time. And that information then flows back through to our uh, management centres where we have our commercial people that are overviewing what's happening in the field. So the top slide is our, our DBOT TV. So at most of our managerial locations, we run a, a big screen and it scrolls through the projects and we get to see what's happening in the field and often that provides, uh, well, it provides very good integration, but also there's some commercial triggers in there that might cause somebody in commercial to, you know, to ask the question about what's happening out on a job. Uh, the top, top right hand box is about the, uh, the AI that we use to overlay. So we run a commercial language model over most of the transactions that are happening through this digital environment and it looks for trigger words. So if we see something around a, a buried asset, you know, that might drive a latent condition argument which is an opportunity for us to be able to claim that back with our client. Um, and, and I would say this is game changing, I mean we, we work with a range of tier ones 
um, in the market and we, we look into their, their systems and nobody is doing this and, and we've invested you know, very strongly in this space and you know, this speaks to the question that came earlier about well, how do we increase the margin. We do it by efficiency in the field and integrated systems. We get people focused on managing work not managing administration and obviously looking for opportunity. So this is a big part of driving our business going forward to increase the gross margins that we, we can get out of our, our contracting work. And the bottom, bottom left of the slide is our, our IGM, which is our integrated governance model. So this is where we bring together all the reporting on a, on a monthly basis. And we've got um, you know, three levels of redundancy in there for, for controls. You know, we have in-field, we certainly have our, my level in, in aggregating it, but we've also got our capability expertise that sits alongside me in planning, in commercial, in legal, um, to review that information on a monthly basis and, and, and look for negative trends and act very early. And, and that's the key to this, this area, is really knowing your positions and being able to dive in. You, know, you can change nothing at the back end, but you can change a lot at the front end. So this is a, a very fundamental and important part of how we operate. Oh, look, in, in, in transmission, um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, it's, it's a market we've be, been in for some time, but there is tremendous growth coming in this particular area. Um, you know, the, the very simple way to, to, to think about this is the existing large transmission networks were all built a long time ago around coal generation. So very thick in the centre around coal-fired plants and very thin out on the periphery. All the renewables projects come on on the periphery. So the network needs upgrading and augmenting to be able to deal with this influx of, uh, of renewable energy. And that's where the opportunity comes for us in building large um, transmission lines and substations. And having that deep capability I spoke to before really sets us apart. There's very few players in Australia in this particular market. You know, we've got one, one major competitor and then there's sort of the, you know, the next level that are coming in. But, but right now in the COVID world, we've got the people, the capability and the engineering solutions. So we're well placed. Uh, Electronet's Air Peninsula opportunity is, is just kicking off. Uh, it's going very well. We got in there under early works and we're ahead of programs. So it's a fantastic opportunity for us. Another project of reference there, uh, Alinta's Energy, Alinta Energy's Chichester project, ultimately FMG are the end user. And, and this is about bringing in uh, you know, a solar farm um, into an existing network. And, and finally, the, the bottom point is, you know, the next evolution of that is hydrogen battery storage and solar integrated solutions. And we have the expertise and wherewithal to play in that market. Again, this is an integrated approach. Uh, Pat Burke will talk to that a bit more, but we see tremendous opportunity for us to engineer and deliver these solutions um, in, this, in this burgeoning market. In transport, uh, a few of the projects, well one at the top we've completed, uh, Newcastle Light Rail. Um, as we've, we've all heard, building light rail is difficult given, given Sydney Light Rail. Um, the Newcastle project was delivered on time. Um, we made our margin. It's, it's a very good system. And interestingly, Keolis Downer are the operator. So there was really some synergy in us building it to then have the operator come in at the back end. And that takes you know, a, a bit of pain out of the interface that would normally be there. So that was a fantastic project for us. Um, we're currently out there now building Parramatta light rail and it's going well. But some of the other projects here, um, Transport for New South Wales, uh, the, the, the TAP program, which is Transport Access Program. This is about improving station amenity for DDA access. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of work on a range of Sydney stations. We've done very well in that space. We've, we've outperformed our, our tended expectation. Uh, that's a managing contractor framework. So we, you know, we, we rely on a big supply chain, including internal, to deliver that work. Uh, the Warrnambool line upgrade, we, we're hard at it at the moment. Um, that is a DNC model, but it is a little bit different in that it's got a very, very, very high uh, signalling content to it. And we've got a very strong rail signalling offering down in Victoria. So that project is, uh, is moving along nicely. Uh, the Berry to Bomadary joint venture is, uh, is a job for New South Wales government. Uh, scheduled for completion uh, shortly and again uh, that, that links up freeway grade road from, from Berry down to, to narrow Bombardary area in New South Wales. Um, we, we don't always do uh, just transport. This is a defence infrastructure project, uh, RAAF Williamtown. 
Um, it's an ECI contract, so early contractor engagement, which is a, a really nice spot to be when the competitors have fallen away and you, you get to do the the one-on-one -on -one negotiation. Uh, again, a, another great joint opportunity where the, the road surfaces team and uh, some of the spotless defence personnel are in in a, in a three-way opportunity for Downer to be able to go forward and deliver for defence. Uh, Denny Avenue is a level crossing removal project, 100% uh, Downer opportunity over in WA. Uh, just had a huge shutdown to get the lion's share of the work done in the last few weeks and it went very well and the asset was delivered back on time. Uh, proving that with the right systems and approach, you, know, you can get this complex work done um, to program and to budget. And, and finally, I've called out there uh, the New West Alliance, which is a 50-50 uh, joint venture with CPB, delivering a, a rail expansion project in WA. But again, it's an alliance framework, and it's a, it's a, it's a particular kind of alliance where a lot of that upfront risk that would normally see in the alliance has actually been carved out. So the utilities work, uh, work with land access was all done by government, leaving us to get in and do the work that we, we understand and do well. So look, that's a little bit of a snapshot of the, uh, of, of the project's business um, within, within the Australian context. Um, final point would be, you know, we are always working on the portfolio split because it's, it isn't all projects in there. We're actually also doing a lot of uh, rail maintenance activities for Rio Tinto up in the Pilbara, which is you know, on a seven year horizon. And more and more we're starting to see that, um, you know, that transmission, I suppose, from you know, build it and leave it to build it and actually maintain it. So that's, a, you know, that's a, a portfolio split that we're working to achieve more of maintenance. And you know, it's, it, it's a journey we're on and it's going quite well. So thank you. Dante, Kamala, Mark, they, uh, their, you know, their responsibility sits across a huge chunk of the downer uh, business, the transport uh, business in Australia. So um, I'm glad to say we've got a really good, uh, we've got a good amount of time for you to ask them questions. You guys don't get much opportunity to, to speak to them or ask them questions. Uh, so here is, uh, here is an opportunity. So um, we've got quite a bit of time. So um, Elise. Thank you. I've got two Two questions. Um, the first for Dante. Uh, curious on the roads, can you talk a little bit, you talked about the recycling component, can you talk a bit about where you are in terms of what percentage of the materials you're using now are recycled, where you want to get to, and you also talked a little bit about the cost savings. Can you um, expand on, I guess, how you actually generate, the, generate those cost savings from the recycled materials? And then I've got a second um, for Mark. Please. Sure. Uh, I'm back on, yeah? So with recycling, and, and I mentioned the long, thin black quarry, ultimately materials that we build roads with, if they're 100% virgin materials, they consist predominantly of an aggregate, a sand, and some bituminous products or a petrochemical. Um, once you put that down on the road surface in about 10 to 15 to 20 years' time, depending on how you use that network, that has come to the end of its serviceable life. Now the key ingredients don't disappear. Sure, the, the petrochemical aspect of it uh, oxid, oxidizes a little bit, it gets a bit stiffer, and hence it just starts to fail. Now, by having the right technology, ultimately we can take those products from the roadway, take them back to our facilities where we have stockpiling capability, sort them, measure them, have a look at what their constituents are, add, uh, benefication um, materials to those things and then they become effectively ready to be reused again. Now in order to do that, um, originally you start with, a, with a, a, a combination of the materials and you add them all together into a big mixing bowl. The second time around you've got them all mixed together and you can't separate them. So you need the technology in our asphalt plants, in our manufacturing capability to be able to recreate your materials from an already um, combined uh, source. So that's the technology that we've invested in. Right now we're operating across all of our manufacturing at about 12 to 15 percent. We have some facilities that can generate well in excess of 70 percent recycled content. Um, the new ones that we're building in Brendale and in Sydney uh, to replace our Rose Hill plant are capable of uh, recycling up to 100 percent. Now the key driver here I guess from a cost perspective is raw materials, uh, for example, aggregates are very, very expensive to produce. 
you need to cart them to your site. And once you add the aggregates and the petrochemicals, I mean, we all, we all fall victim to what we pay at the Bowser for, for, a, for a hydrocarbon. And bitumen tends to track the, the value of, of fuel. Now that bitumen, it goes into your, your end product of asphalt at a rate of about 5%, but its cost is the equivalent of the aggregate percentage. So being able to recycle a high component of the naturally or the, the, the leftover binder enables you to save significant money um, compared to substituting that binder with virgin materials as you go uh, into the future. So what we're seeing now is growing our manufacturing recapability into higher recycled content, which takes assets that have come off the network, sorted, um, improved, and then back in um, at a lower cost compared to its virgin equivalent. So that, that's how it happens. And, and I guess where we'd like to get to is uh, in excess of probably 30, 35% as we move forward into the future, but ultimately get our customers to recognise that they have a valuable asset in their road networks that is perpetually recyclable. Now we can also add other things like post-consumer waste like glass that uh, substitutes for sand and the soft plastics that I spoke about, which ultimately at the end of the day, the only types of plastics we take are ones that are capable of being repurposed and re-engineered and recycled again and again and again well into the future. We're conscious of creating problems into the future and before we do anything today, we, we need to take the next 10 to 15 year lens on it about what's going to happen next time around for that cycle. We just can't afford to waste them. Does that sort of answer where, it's, it's pretty complex, but there's I good. don't think I got it understood at all, but I think I got the gist, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and then this, the second question was for, for Mark. Um, I was curious, you talked about the profitless um, boom um, and I think we've probably all seen that in this room. Yeah. Um, keen to understand just from more from an industry perspective, what do you think has been the trigger for that to change if there has been one? And where are we in terms of the transition of that occurring? Because I know it does take some years to roll mm. through contracts that might have already been bid um, to understand, I guess, the industry landscape um, that you are then operating in. Um, so separate to, to, I guess, where you're operating with more alliance style contracts, but more from an industry perspective. Yeah, uh, look, I think from an industry perspective, um, there is change, but you're right, it is slow. I mean, you know, since, since that uh, end of that 2014 boom, you know, there, there's been change and uh, governments such as New South Wales probably pushed um, harder to, to accept the fact that change needed to happen from a risk allocation model. Um, the 10-point procurement plan was instigated in New South Wales, probably going back now three or four years, and, and we've seen that slowly permeate through the sort of machinations of, of what is a big beast, and we are starting to see, you know, d definitive change in the, in the contract models. And to a, a, a lesser extent, that's sort of permeated out into every state. You know, Victoria is probably next, next cab off. And then, then WA and you know Queensland, to be fair, is probably probably lagging a little bit, but we are starting to see the the changes now. So that's you know that is a general change. I mean, it, it, going back uh, prior to 2014, most contracts were very uh, lumpy DNC, you know PPP style. All risk goes out to the uh, to the private sector for them to manage. And you know, there's been you know. Uh, a number of failures in organisations that, that, that you would know a lot of, certainly a lot of tier two uh, companies have, have folded and, and tier ones have suffered a lot of pain. We've seen the influx of a lot of overseas companies, a lot of Spanish companies pack up and go home. Um, so, you know, that, that, that really has been the catalyst for the change. You know, this infrastructure needs to be built and you know, it'll only be built under the, under the right models from an industry perspective. And we're seeing the change be pushed out through uh, ACA, Australian Contractors Association, and all the different bodies are lobbying very hard in this space. For us though, we, we, we get sort of a second cut at it and we can really pick the eyes um, out of that change as I mentioned and you know we, we look at all our opportunities through a focused sort of ABC um, lens and you know I, I can certainly fill up our, uh, our, our required um, you know, revenue budget with really good focus A opportunities. So, you know, and we're lucky to be able to do that in the framework of Downer. 
you know, obviously being a very diversified business, my part is, you know, a part of a very big machine. Um, not so for a lot of the, you know, tier one competitors that we're in, you know, they're, they're fully um, hitched and engaged to the construction space. Therefore, that they are probably picking off certainly focus A, but probably some focus Bs and Cs as well. So hopefully that, that answers your question. Hi there. Um, uh, first question's for Kamal. You made a, an interesting comment as to the uh, the rail capability giving an important advantage for electric buses. So I was wondering if you uh, didn't necessarily uh, come naturally to me to uh, to link the two, but I was wondering if you could do that. And in doing so, um, does that mean that you're also ideally suited to offer fast charging? networks, those sorts of things, please. Yeah, so coming, on, yep, coming back to the electric buses, so what we're finding is uh, that industry was predominantly a manufacturing-based industry, so built to the customer's needs. What we're seeing, they're moving into a systems engineering, systems and integration type approach, which is a foundation to what the rail industry approaches design and delivery of their products. So systems engineering is a requirements-based approach to developing a design and proving that design through the manufacturing, testing and commissioning of the product. So very adaptable in terms of our core competence in the rail sector can be applied in the bus sector because obviously the interface it may have with the wayside or the land side side of things, which is the charging side of things. Sorry, and the second question was? Well, the second one was, does that um does that mean you're ideally suited for fast charging networks and, and things like that? For oh, absolutely, absolutely. And that's one of the things, if you look at the integrated model we have on the downer roof, um, the one downer uh, approach, is we're doing a lot of that wayside work with, um, with um, um, Mark's um, business as well, because that, uh, that applies in the rail sector and can be applied in the, mm -hmm. in the bus sector as well. Okay, great. And Hopefully then, answered uh, your question. Yeah, no, thank okay, you. Thank you. And then the second question I had was for Dante, uh, and it was around, I think, a follow-up perhaps to the recycling question. Um, so your Reconifelt uh, product had, um, the early trials of that had shown signs of, um, of good fatigue and, uh, and defamation resistance in terms of, the, uh, in terms of testing against Virgin. Um, you, you've talked a lot to, uh, to recycled product, which is obviously a, um, you know, something that the whole of government is, is approaching but hasn't necessarily taken all the, uh, the steps in order to incentivise that. Uh, are the government requirements in this area standards that they're, uh, that they're looking for and those sorts of things, are they moving fast enough for you to... Uh, exploits the wrong word, but utilise your competitive advantage that you believe you have in this area? Yeah, really good point. Um, I guess ultimately we're pretty comfortable with the way governments are moving in this space, I, I guess, uh, and just forgive the, the platform, but um, I guess there are parts of government that insist on you know, as close to 100% virgin as you can, and they're on high, re high reliability networks, and they want to make sure that they don't want to take any sorts of risk. And yet, there's the governments that we all live as part of, and you get your rate notices to say that we're sustainable, we're putting our recycling out, and we're doing all these sorts of things in the local government. So it's almost like a two-speed thing, where you're saying to the, to the state governments, look, don't, don't go down that recycling path. You, you, you don't want to go there, because if they keep specifying the virgin high cost stuff and we can use another market for the, the high recycle and the, and the markets are, are working symbiotically, then it's a really good outcome for us. What we've done is ensure that the specifications that we put out there are the ones that the clients are now moving forward towards and say, yeah, we want that material. That means it's our specification. It's a performance base. We've done enough testing now over many, many years to understand how it works, it's actually a, a better product because if you just think about it intuitively, anything that survives 10 to 20 years out in the open road and getting pounded, you get the best of the best that's left. And we take that back, repurpose it, understand what it is and put it back out there for another go. Most road making materials, if they've got any signs of weakness, they disappear pretty quickly and they fall apart. So we only, you know, the second time around, we get left with the good stuff. We're influencing um, specifications. 
we're confident with the products that we're putting there, and we're at a lower cost as well. So it's a, a pretty unique space to be in. Okay. So how far would you say the, the governments are, particularly the, the state governments, I guess, which are responsible for specifications? How how far are we down the path in terms of moving towards the specifications? That it's incremental. Like? Um, I'll go back to 2013. The South Australian government um, had a, an ideal where they'd get to 50% recycle. Um, in order to do that, you need to change technology. And I think it's fair to say that they're, they're moving towards that. So they, they are accepting. Have they changed their ironclad, you know, 100 years of, of experience specification overnight? No, they're not doing that. They're, they're taking very small steps, but we're very comfortable at the pace that they're moving at. Once we put these new facilities up, like Brendale, like Sydney, that now takes us to 100%, that'll be the catalyst for them to say, you know what, we, we do have trust, we know the market can deliver, because if you don't have that tech, you can't get to those percentages. Okay, great, that's all I had. Morning, guys. It's Jake Kakanis from Jarden. Just to build on Elise's question earlier, is there any way, Dante, that you can quantify the difference, for example, in the road base between virgin sands and some of the recycled materials, particularly glass, that you're seeing just in terms of cost savings? It seems to be one of the major ones that competitors talk to. Um, so you're looking for net cost savings or percentage-wise? However you want to metricise it. OK. So if you... <laughs> Let's just stick with 100 bucks a ton, 100 dollars a ton for, for an asphalt manufactured. Um, the, the, the wrap that we um, harvest from the road, as it were, the recycled asphalt pavement that we re harvest from the existing road, still has an inherent value um, of more than 80 percent of that. So if you're not paying for a quarry or a or a petrochemical company to get the key ingredients that are now mixed together and you're finding it on a roadside, as it were, um, and taking it back to your facility and repurposing it and sending it back out there, you are making a significant saving to the finished product. Now, you do have transport costs, you do have logistics costs, you have testing, you have um, uh, separating, granulating. There, there are things that we need to do. But in, in, in essence, it's a significant material saving that is driven by technology to enable you to do that. If you don't have the tech, you can't do it, so it's a bit of a vicious circle. But uh, in short, the value of the end product is pretty close to the, the start product if you've got the right tech going forward. Thanks for that. And then just to get confidence around volumes, how much of the government support in each of those key regions, let's say East Coast at the moment, do you need or are we already at critical mass and it's actually more about the technological capabilities? Um, so yeah, there's, there's not too many that can do what we do from a recycling perspective. The, the volumes in the market have grown traditionally in the last 20 years, probably exceeding a lot of the expectations uh, around the networks. And, and we've seen that from industry because We've come from a workplace nationally and all of our competitors have had 1960s style manufactured plants that are capable of 60 to 100 tonne an hour. As time's gone on, as uh, our buying um, capability, the, the uh, advances from technology around the world, we're now putting in plants that are capable of throughput of in excess of 300 to 400 tonne an hour. So what's happening is there's plenty of capability in the market um, throughput per hour is higher, our productivity of our people with our equipment, our, our paving resources, what they're able to do in a shift is going up and up and up. So the, really the, the main differentiator is your ability to, to get cheaper in the, in the product supply, which is probably in excess of two thirds of the net cost of a tonne of asphalt that goes out there from that perspective. So there is enough market, there is plenty of volume, but it's how you translate that volume into margin is, is the key. Hi, uh, Justin. Uh, Justin oh no. uh, Justin's here. Uh, just for Kamal on the um, sort of rail business, and sort of mentioned the unique, I guess, capabilities compared to competitors. Does that help you during the the tender process, or the the customers tend to sort of segment the different uh, bits of work to try and get the best price? How does that sort of work from a contract perspective? I think it's on. Traditionally, they were segmenting, but I think with these larger type projects, I think they're looking at more integration. So, so with these complex projects, there's 
there's a lot of interface risk. So the customers are looking to pass or flow down that inter uh, integration interface risk. So obviously our competitors predominantly go down the JV path or but there's complexities with that with the scope split and who carries the risk around that interface as well. So internally we've got that capability to manage that in-house and reduce that risk within. But we're very selective in terms of the projects that we actually pursue. So coming back to that strategic slide where those projects with low interface risk that have a high revenue stream over 20 to 33, uh, 30 years through O&M contracts. So that's how we see a competitive advantage there. And, and just sort of tying into that um, model, I think the slide with the two to three years EPC and that, does that change with a project where you might have to build a rolling stock sort of onshore or how does that evolve? Because that seemed to be the future. So a very good question. So HCMT is a five to six year build. So that EPC period is, is a consideration, key consideration in terms of our risk management approach, but it's that long-term O&M stream that is ex extremely important. So we're very selective around that. Um, Grant touched on localization. It's, it's in the cornerstone of what we're looking at going forward. In, in New South Wales, the Premier some time ago said, we will never build rolling stock onshore. She publicly said that, but I think the way the environment is, the political environment is at the moment, I think that's something they, they may be considering revisiting. John Patel. Thank you. Um, just across the panel, just a general question on sort of labour and people issues, um, you know, how you're managing sort of uh, through this sort of uh, post-COVID or COVID world. Um, and, you know, we're obviously seeing widespread an anecdotes of labour shortages, particularly, more particularly in WA, but how are you seeing that impact your business and your ability to, to recover those costs? Yeah, I might um, we'll gather that up to begin with. Uh, well, certainly, uh, as I mentioned before, um, we've got pretty good existing capability in most locations. I think WA, is, it's, it's a good one to call out because a couple of the big projects that you saw up on the board are WA based. Um, we've been in WA a long time in the rail space. Um, yeah, before we evolved into the transport business, um, we, we had a business there doing rail maintenance. So, you know, the foundations go back quite some time. So we've been building into that. Um, it's certainly a strain, but what we're finding now is, you know, we've seen um, out of town contractors, you might say, come over and, and win work on, I guess, their technical solution and merit, but then it leaves a bit of a problem. They don't have people. So def definitely this, um, you know, poaching of labour and trying to, trying to mitigate that is an issue. And, and how we deal to that is, you know, it really is around those, um, the operating model that we use. We put a lot of time training our people. Down is a very diverse organisation, so you can have a career path in our business that might start in projects, but it might go somewhere else. And that is attractive um, for, for retention. Um, but but it, it is a difficult situation and, and you know, all, all, all we have to do is try to, you know, keep ahead of the curve as much as, as we can. I know of Phil De Dante, I know he'll talk about apprentices and, uh, and, and trainees, and that, that's another big part of our, our approach. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of um, the rail business, so uh, we've had minimal impact uh, as a result of uh, COVID in that sense, because obviously we, we support critical infrastructure. We maintain the largest uh, train network, or the largest um, um, quantity of trains in, in Sydney. So we've had minimal impact and we have a high um, blue-collar blue -collar workforce. Um, in terms of the project side, um, I, I put up a point there on the SGT project where we've had zero impact. Um, we've been able to manage COVID with our people. Um, so we've had a relatively low impact across our business in terms of COVID. Look, from my perspective, I, I guess we've recognised a while ago that uh, getting people attracted to the industry is traditionally probably not that easy. Uh, we've invested pretty heavily in a cadetship program for uh, engineers, um, you know, white collar style, tertiary educated kids from regional Australia to come and join us. So we, we've been putting on 17 to 18 young school leavers every year for the last 10 years. 50-50 uh, gender balance, 
We're getting them from regional Australia. We're getting them into our business early. They're not stacking shelves at night so that they're out there working on their, on their holidays and any time they get a break in the big cities because we've got that capability. Um, so, so we're starting to see the, the, you know, get the fruit from, from that effort right now. Importantly, in regional locations also, that whole diversity point of view, um, the mechanisation of a lot of the tasks that, we, that we're doing today means that there is no reason that from a diversity perspective we can't have you know, almost a 50-50 uh, workforce. Now, we, we won't get there tomorrow, but that's another opportunity for us and we're seeing more and more females um, and diverse, um, diverse background people coming into our business as a result. It's attractive, we've got a good name, they know we're doing the right thing in the community, so um, we're starting to see those problems not as bad as what we would have thought, but nonetheless, if this work keeps coming the way it is, then that's going to create another issue in itself. Wei Wing. All right, thanks, guys. Wei Wing from JP Morgan. Um, so just on roading, I uh, appreciate, you know, it's a very attractive sort of segment, government-backed long-term contracts. Um, just wondering uh, about the level of competition in this space and, and just broadly how sticky are these contracts? Um, I, I guess I'm asking in the context of a Sydney Roads contract that was... Um, lost last year? Yeah, look, um, the, the maintenance contracts themselves, it's a pretty small market with a few competitors. And ultimately, whilst we've missed out on some work here in Sydney, we've also been quite successful in other jurisdictions. Um, until we see more outsourcing of this type of work in the marketplace, we're going to find it difficult to grow beyond the percentages that we currently retain, uh, because everyone wants, wants, a, wants a go at the at what it is, and, and I guess uh, sometimes being the incumbent makes it uh, pretty difficult to, you, you almost know a little bit too much about the network as well. Look, we're confident over time from a stewardship perspective that as the networks grow and governments find different ways to get value and savings, they will outsource more and more. But um, it's not just at the road network management space at the stewardship level, we also operate at the supplying of material space as well. So we may well have lost some work to a competitor, but we will ensure that through our, our products and services, we're still supplying into that contract. Very great. And, and then just another uh, question. We're talking a lot about cost out with recycling. Does this cost out go to expanded margins or does it sort of um, you know, get uh, put into bids so you sort of bid more competitively and you gain more share? Oh, it's a bit of both. Um, ultimately, we know what it costs to manufacture 100% version, what the specification says. It's alternative, it's, it's how we go about delivering that work. But invariably, uh, right now, we're, we're, we're being very circumspect on the work that we win and at what margins. Uh, into the future, we're obviously going to have to tighten our belt and we want to make sure that we're still generating the margins that we're doing today and, and maintaining beyond our market share. Perfect. That's all for me, thanks. Any other questions? Any other? Uh, Nathan? Uh, thank you. So there's more questions just around the, I guess, the transport project outlook. Uh, you know, clearly, you've put up a couple of slides that have showed you know, a big bow wave of infrastructure projects that are set to be delivered. I think we kind of understand that there's a lot of mega projects that will underpin that outlook. Um, but I, you know, I also know that you know we're unlikely to see down of laying in a in a tunnelling project, for instance, in terms of the major civil projects. But at that sort of lower end of the market, where we'd see projects valued at around that sort of 200 to 300 million dollar mark, I'm curious to understand to what extent the government stimulus uh, and increased funding has, uh, has I guess, boosted uh, tendering activity or, or, or boosted your activity levels in that space. I'd be curious to understand just how, or how, how much busier you might be now, for instance, relative to, say, two years ago, pre-COVID, and I guess pre the government's focus on getting some of those shovel-ready projects out to market. Yeah, uh, look, it's, it's a good question. Um, it's probably taking a little longer than we would like to see these projects actually be shovel ready, and it's different in different locations. Uh, WA under the um, the broader Metronet umbrella, and when, when you talk about Metronet, it isn't one rail line; it is a program of work. So inside that program, you've got billion dollar alliances down to um, grade separation jobs that might be, you know, let's say fifty to ninety million dollars, and there was a whole range of those. There'd be fifteen or so grade separation jobs. Uh, they're all starting to come to market now, so WA is a, a pretty big tick. 
Um, down in Victoria, it, it, it was a bit slow, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, but we're starting to see new opportunities come to market in that range. Um, interestingly, in the road space in Victoria, they've changed the, the contracting model to a, uh, a, a more of a risk sharing model. So a, a lot of it's under a, um, a framework of reimbursable cost and we're seeing those go to market. So the first round um, came out in, in, in February. Um, we didn't participate purely because we're finishing up some jobs down there at the moment, but we're well placed for the next round and we're in fact, you know, we'll, we'll be going forward looking for some opportunities in uh, in, in the next month or so, and they're ready to go. So, and, and again, you know, they're in that sort of, you know, 50 to $200 million range. Uh, New South Wales, we're starting to see a lot of mid-sized work come. I mean, that program of works that I mentioned, the, the transport access program, um, that is ongoing. Uh, we've, we've also um, picked up some projects under the Sydney Metro, and again, they're, they're smaller scale, so they're um, a program of six railway station upgrades, and they're, you know, programs uh, probably $250 million in total over those six stations. So, you know, it, it, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly strong and, and coming along in, in those areas. Queensland's been, been quite depressed for some time. Uh, you know, we've seen over the last five or six years, there's been some really uh, bigger end of town jobs, but not a lot of those mid-sized jobs. Um, they are starting to come back slowly, but it is more highly competitive because of the fact that there hasn't been that work and there's a lot of hungry contractors there. We don't have large exposure to Queensland at all. Um, we do a couple of very interesting things in Queensland. We do work up in Cape York on the roads and we do that with a 100% um, Indigenous owned company called Barma, the work under Cape York Partnerships. And we do that as a joint venture um, for two reasons. One is it's, it's good profitable work for Downer, but the other is it gives us an opportunity to work with that firm and lift their capability. And we've seen, uh, we've seen work come to us every year through TMR through that program, so that'll be ongoing. Uh, also in Queensland, we're doing some defence work. So we're doing um, Shoalwater Bay project at the moment, which is, which is an upgrade. So I, I tell you this because we're active in Queensland, but not necessarily in the same way we are in other markets. But, but rest assured, um, given the size of that pipeline coming, there'll be plenty of opportunity for us in the size range and risk profile range that, you know, that, that we'll happily uh, deal to. And sorry, Dante, I think you, you put up a map showing your, your regional presence was pretty solid. Um, with that step up in roads maintenance activity that's been underpinned by some stimulus projects, are you seeing a significant step up in regional activity um, relative, or more so relative to metropolitan activity or is it fairly consistent across both those sides of the market? Uh, it's fair to say that it's probably some of the stimulus funding and the type of work is we're seeing bigger impacts in our regional locations. South Australia at the moment, the government there is doing a fantastic job of getting lots and lots of work to market and uh, we've got a very strong workforce that uh, has been honed over a number of years to deliver these types of projects. So we're at uh, very much capacity in those areas and uh, sort of now trying to work out ways to extend that as long as we can. Um, in other places, West Australia, resources, materials, um, it's, st it's starting to get tight in finding materials as well. Um, but look, it's, it's pretty balanced, um, pretty comfortable with where everything is. Uh, as Mark mentioned, Queensland's still a little bit quiet for, from, from that perspective, but it just allows us to move those resources into other places right now and, and continue, um, you know, keep, keep the, those places like Queensland on lower flame, uh, but, but continue to, to make maximum um, inroads into what we're doing in other parts of a national um, market like Australia. Okay, look, I think um, I'm going to make sure we stick to the time. Um, that was a great...